where am I going to go from this? What is God saying to me? And am I going to believe it? And am I going to act on it? And I'm saying this. Your mind sometimes is willing, but your body is weak. You guys are tired. There's a lot of things going on. I'm going to challenge you with this. If you start to feel yourself getting tired, just stand up, go to the back and stand up and listen to it. Okay? Just listen because you can't afford to miss what's going to be shared this morning. The Spirit's wanting to say something to you. God's wanting to say something to you this morning. And you cannot afford to miss what he wants to say to you. Amen? So if you feel like you're wrestling with it, and you know when you're wrestling with it, you're when you're fighting this, and you're just like, oh my gosh, I got to bed at 2.30. I know some of you guys stayed up, and you, you stayed up till 4.30 just talking about things that God had put on your heart to talk about. It was cool to hear that you were just challenged with things, but so your body starts to shut down. You got to stand up, and you got to stay active. You got to stay alive, and you got to discipline yourself, okay, to hear what God wants to say to you this morning. Amen? All right? So, Jamie, come on up. We're excited to hear what the Spirit wants to say through you this morning. All right. If everybody starts standing up, uh, I'll know it's not the Holy Spirit. You're just tired. Okay. So, um, yeah, we're going to wrap up here because i got to bolt out of here right at 11. So, um, so one question that, there's a lot of questions that have come up, but one that's come up is, and I appreciate you all asking me these questions, is, so when I'm talking about, when I was giving the example last night about my friend Khalid, um, when we pray in the Muslim context, when we're working in Muslim countries, Muslims are very open to dreams and visions. It's like how they talk about most everything. And so I can go into a mosque in the Middle East uh, which we've done many times, and I can stand up and say, how many of you have had a dream about Aisa or Jesus? And 50% of the men will raise their hand. Like, that's how often they dream about Jesus or have pictures of Jesus in their mind. And so when we go to meet with a Muslim and we ask them, do you want to hear Jesus talk to you right now? They've either... A lot of them have either had a dream about Jesus or they've heard about that. And it's so prevalent that this one um, group of people that, it's a team from Australia that work in the West Bank, they put an ad in the, news, in the Arabic newspaper that said, if you've had a dream about Jesus, call this number. And they got flooded with phone calls. And that's how they actually started Bible study groups. So in that context, it works really well to do that. And so the question is, well, if you, can, if you do that, then, do you, then what do I have to do? Do I have to talk about Jesus? The answer is yes. And so even when, even when we're working in the U.S., this is how we do it with people. We pray with people. We don't pray for people. We pray with them. Because it's, it's not important what I say about God at first. It's important that they know they can hear from God. Because then when I leave, they, have, they know I have access to God. But when people hear from God, they, they hear some things and it's moving to them, but then our job is to teach them and to get them into the Word, and that's our part. And so, is it God speaking? Is it me speaking? Yes, it's both. You're a team. It's you. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you in a team. That's you're working together. It's not all on you, and yet God's inviting us in to be a part of what He's doing. It's incredible. So Khalid, every time Khalid would go through these experiences, he would come back to Shannon in the white van in the lawn chairs in the desert, and they would dig right back into the Bible. That's where Khalid was learning what was happening to him. It's really beautiful. Instead of trying to use the Bible to get to God, we're asking God to bring him down into the Bible. That's what we're doing. And so they have an experience... So, for example, there's a million examples of this, but so in, in, uh, we were working in a Middle Eastern country. I had a new team with me, young team. I, we're always recruiting young teams. And I said to our young team, let's, let's go out and let's see if um, we can just kind of go talk to Muslims that we don't know, invite them into something, and see if we can just pray with them. Let's try that. that was back when we were very first practicing. So whenever God gives you an idea, the way that you have to go out and do it. You can't just have these ideas and bury them. You have to go out and try it. So I said to our young team, let's go out and if you're, as you're, we all have different jobs in the country. So when we go, we're not missionaries in the traditional sense. 
we are employed by companies and governments to do jobs in different countries, and while we're there, we live missionally, just like you should be doing here. Um, so we all have jobs. Our team ha all had jobs, and we go out and we work our jobs all day long, and then we come back at night and we meet together and we talk about, okay, who did you talk to, what's happening? And then we, every two weeks we would have a, a big dinner with all the Muslims that we worked with, and we would have 40 or 50 Muslims come every time we did this. And then in those times together, we would start talking about who is God, what does it mean to hear God, can I experience God, is God just in a book, like that kind of stuff. So one of our young guys was out, he worked, uh, he worked for the embassy, and he's, he's talking to a Jordanian who works in the British embassy, and they're having this conversation. And the Jordanian, who's an atheist Muslim, I didn't know. Just because they're Muslim doesn't mean they believe in God. Just like a Jew, my wife is Jewish, but just because she's Jewish, it doesn't mean anyone in her family thinks the Bible is true. They don't. But they're Jewish. That's who they are. It's their blood. It doesn't mean they believe anything about God. So this Jordanian says to our young guy, Andrew, do you believe in Jesus? And Andrew says, yes. And the Muslim guy, who is a uh, PhD in linguistics from Moscow University, that was his training back in Jordan working, uh, he says, can you exp I, don't, I don't believe in Jesus. Explain Jesus to me. Well, that's a hard question. And so Andrew says to him, um, I I can try and explain Jesus to you, but uh, how would you like to meet Jesus? And the guy's like, are you kidding me? No, no. And the guy says, yeah, okay, let's do that. So Andrew says, well, I'm going to take you to my friend, which is me. So if anyone on our teams, if anyone's going to make a mistake, it's, it has to be me first. So if anyone's going to fail and get in trouble, it's me first so that the young part of our team just watches me get arrested and put in jail, and they don't do it, so they learn. Okay, never do that again. Uh, and so Andrew calls me and says, hey, I met this guy. He wants to, and so they, we meet together. He comes to my apartment, our apartment. So it's me and Andrew, and this guy, is, his name is Omar, and we're talking. He's, a, he's an intellectual, Omar, Muslim, and he says, I was asking Andrew, do you guys believe in Jesus? Yes. Can you explain Jesus to me? And I said, I can as much as I know, but how about if we just experience Jesus and then talk about him? How about that? He's like, whatever. So I said, so let's, let's pray together. And as soon as I say that, he gets down on his knees and puts his head on the floor because that's how they pray, you know? And we're like, oh. He just goes, okay, let's pray. He gets down on the floor, puts his head down. And so Andrew gets down on one side of him, and I get down on the other side of him. And uh, what, what do you pray? For the, and so I said, I say, and we're just experimenting. Like, we're not afraid because God loves us, and, and God doesn't need me to protect him. Right? I, how can I protect God? God protects us. So I'm not afraid. I'm just going to try and, like, Lord please show up, you know, that kind of thing. And so we get down on our knees and put our heads on the floor so that Omar knows that we're actually praying instead of praying like a Christian prays with our feet up on the table, you know, laying back with a coffee cup. They're not, that's a different culture. Like they would find that disrespectful to God that you're not down on your knees with your head on the ground. And so we're down, I'm on one side, Andrew's on the other, Omar's in the middle. And I say, God, um, this is, this is our friend Omar, and then later Andrew said, do we have to introduce people to God? Is that necessary? Doesn't he already know him? And I'm like, Andrew, shut up. So, we're like, so I just said, this is Omar, God, this is our friend. Um, he has a question. His question is, is Jesus real? How does he understand Jesus? Um, and so, Lord, out of your kindness and mercy towards us, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel prays, not because we are righteous, but because you are merciful, O God, act, listen, act. So not because I am great and spiritual and all that, but just because God loves you and Omar and Andrew. God, you love us. Will you speak to us? Why would God say no? Why would he do that? And if he says no, I'm not sure that's a God I would want to be in a relationship with. It must be the God who speaks, the God who creates and initiates, the God who loves, the God who sacrifices for us. So we're calling out to that one, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, Lord, would you just speak 
to our friend Omar so he can understand or begin to understand who Jesus is. And then we just are silent. And so we're just waiting. <laughs> and I have my hand on Omar. He, Omar was about 35 at the time. And so, and he starts to weep. He's like bouncing. He's down on the ground. He's bouncing like this, weeping. And I'm looking at him, and Andrew like sits up and goes, like, what do we do? And I'm like, get back down. I don't know. Get back down. And he's weeping like this, and he's just sobbing. And then after a little while, he's, he sits up. Omar sits up, and he's wiping his eyes. And then he stands up, and he sits back down on the couch, and we sit next to him. And I'm just looking at him, and I said, are you okay? And he goes, wow. He said, I said, did God speak to you? And he said, yeah. He said, but I don't know what it means. So what happened? This is, this is co-laboring with God. This is what this is. And so Omar says, I, I don't know. When you prayed about Jesus, I had this picture in my mind that I was an infant, a, a little infant, laying in mud. And that the Christ, this is his word in Arabic. He called Jesus the Christ. He says, the Christ came and picked me up and washed me with water and said I had to be reborn. He goes, I don't know what that means. But it was so moving to him. And so I get the Bible. And so where am I going to look in the Bible? John chapter 3. And so, I, I, so he thinks the Bible's not true. But suddenly, when he reads John chapter 3, he looks at me and he goes, this is what happened. He's reading the story of Nicodemus. And he's going, this is what happened. This is, true. this is what happened to me. John chapter 3. Suddenly the Bible is true. With no debate, no argument about the Quran and the Bible and all that stuff, suddenly it's true. And he reads the story of Nicodemus, and he starts to cry again, and he says, I am Nicodemus. I am Nicodemus. He said, I'm Nicodemus because I, I know my religion, but I do not know the Spirit of God, and I want to be born again right now. And, and so we're like, okay. And so he embraces Christ to make him born again. And he was our first believer in that city. And then a month later, when we ha invite all of our coworkers over and we have 50 Muslims in our house and Donna is making dinner for all these people and the young, young women on our team, and we, and we do this, we have this, we eat dinner together, all the Muslims go off to pray because they have to pray, you know, at dusk. So they have to, you have to have a room in your house for all the Muslims to pray or they won't come over. So they all go off and pray. And Omar goes with them. And when he's in the room, because he's the oldest one of the group of young Muslim professionals. And so he's asked, they ask him to lead the khutbah, it's called, the prayer. And so he says, he says, I will, but let's ask God a question as we pray. Let's ask God to tell us about Isa, Jesus, while we pray. Why is he going to do that? Because that's how he met Jesus. And so he leads the Muslim group in that prayer. Out of that group, 14 Muslims come to faith in Jesus. And this whole movement starts. When that movement starts, as soon as they start to experience God, we jump right into the Gospels with them. And we start studying the Gospels because the Gospels explain to them what's happening to them. And so we call it the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the people of God. And that's a people movement. And every two weeks we would do this thing and the Muslims would bring their friends. And they called it the new idea. That's what they called it. They would say to their coworkers, have you heard the new idea? What new idea? It's with the team. They called us the team. These are all just words they made up. We meet with the team. What team? The team with the new idea. It's a, it's a, and they would bring their friends to our house, and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the new idea was that Jesus died for Muslims. That was the new idea. Isn't that, like, who would not want to be a part of that? Khalid was one of those guys in another place. That's how Khalid was part of another movement like that. And for Khalid, it was a lot of torture and pain. For this group of Muslims, it wasn't. It was very joyous for them. 
And some people, some people think that living in the United States, like we are like religiously free and we're the best. But when you go to countries like China, like we worked in China from Thailand all the way to North Korea, me and a team, and we, we worked just in, uh, for the Chinese government all the way up there. And the Chinese believers and the movement in China is greater than the Christian movement in the United States. It's greater and stronger. See, we think we're so free and we have it all. We don't. The Chinese, the Chinese, I, I would go live in China if I wanted to really experience Christ in a deep way. That's where I would go. I wouldn't come here. Our, our religion is all about politics and debate. Theirs is a deep faith in the living Christ, and they'll go to jail for it. It's amazing. It's incredible. I love being with those people. Anyway, so is it me talking? Is it God talking? Yes. When we pray, is God talking to me or am I talking to myself? Yes. If any man is in Christ, we are in Christ. He is in us. We are in him. Our mind is becoming his mind. That's what you want. So that his idea and my idea are the same idea. That's the goal. And not this fractured, here I am over here and here's God over here. And this separation is called sin. And sin kills us. The separation kills us. The isolation kills us. Because we can't save ourselves. So I want to I end this time here. It's been an honor to be here with you. Luke has my information. If you want to connect with me, you can feel free. I have a telephone. You dial the number. I will answer. That's how that works. Uh, you don't have to ask me if you can call me. I, I don't know why people do that. Can I call you? It's like we're dating or something. No, yeah, you can call me. I'm just call me. I don't care. I'll answer the phone. Uh, if I don't leave a message and I'll call you back, so feel free. Um, but what I, I, I want to end with this because this it seems like what the Lord has in his mind. So in the life of David that we're talking about, we can just kind of sum up David like this. And if, if you don't get anything while you're here, get this. David had two ways of thinking in his life. You can, you, you can just watch it through his whole life. There's, he had two ways of thinking. One way of thinking that he used always, he always won. It was always victorious for him. He made smart decisions. He made crazy decisions that worked out. He took total losers and turned them into the best military fighting force of his day because he could teach them how to have their own identity in the kingdom of God, because he had his own identity. And David believed very strongly that he could hear from God. Very strongly he believed that. And, so, and then he would live that out. So, when, so then he had another way of thinking, another way of understanding things that always failed. Every single time he thought this way, it failed. So it's very simple when you read his life, how do you win and how do you lose? This is how simple God wants this to be for you and me. Here's the phrase that begins every passage where David is victorious. Here's the, here's what, here's the line. And David inquired of the Lord. When, that's, when, the, when the story starts, and David inquired of the Lord, he wins. No matter what he does, he wins. And when the passage starts like this, and David thought to himself, he loses. Here's, here's two options you have every day when you're encountering anything in your life. And Jamie inquired of the Lord, victory, or, and Jamie thought to himself, disaster. Like, that's it. Those are the two things. <laughs> Is it the squirrel again? <laughs> the squirrel, the demon squirrel. We don't know where he is. He's over here. He, he went up the stairs. Okay, we're all safe. <laughs> okay. Okay, so just these two ideas, simple ideas. Give grace to the squirrel. He's okay. He's just doing his identity, running around in his identity. So, so you have two options in every situation you find you can ask God what God what do you want me to know and what do you want me to do the whole book of Acts is people asking God what do you want us to know and what do you want us to do that's one lifestyle and then this lifestyle and you just think to yourself and come up with the best thing you can come up with those are the two options in your life 
To, to, to be saved, to be born again, to ask Jesus into your heart, all the ways that we say this, is to say to God, is to say in Christ, Jesus, I invite you into my life in order that I can inquire of you all the rest of my life. That's what it means to invite Christ into your life. <laughs> it, that's, that's what it means to be transformed or saved. And so if, if Jesus is standing in a situation and he's looking at me going, you can come to me and I'll walk you through this whole thing, I would run to Jesus. Just because his plan is going to be better than yours. And it'll be more exciting and it will blow your mind. Because it'll be like, I want you to get a van and lawn chairs and drive around the desert. And no one thinks of that stuff unless you inquire of the Lord. Or you can think to yourself, that's a stupid idea, I'm never doing that. And you can live a boring whatever life. So these are your two options. It's so simple. I just say yes to Jesus. Like, that's my thing. And then, in my, and then he just energizes my true identity into all the stuff that I've ever, ever wished I could ever do beyond even what I planned. Like, what I'm going to do today after 11 o'clock is something that when I was 11, I just wished would happen. And now I'm 59, I'm going to walk right into it. It's like when I was 11 dreaming about this idea, Jesus was right there with, hey, he, going, doing this. Hey, this idea that you're having, hold on to it. It's going to take a while to get to it, but we're going to walk right into this one. Don't forget it. Write it down. That's how you live. It's incredible. Or I can be like, I don't need God. I don't believe. That's fine. That's up to you. Enjoy that boring life. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. So let me tell you. So this is my point this morning, leaving here. You can spend your life inquiring of the Lord however God communicates with you in all the beautiful ways that he will and all the doors that he will open up for you. Or you can just think to yourself. Thinking to yourself, you're pretty powerless because your only reference point is you, and that's not a good reference point. But those are the two options. So here's, a, here's my final example of that. So we have, a, we, have a, so I, we have three biological sons, and we have a fourth son that we kind of picked up on the way. His name is Hamza, and this occurred in Jordan. So let me just tell you about him, and we'll be done, just as an example. So, uh, so our skateboarding son, Caleb, was, uh, went to uh, schools where he was the only American. And so he, so he spoke Arabic and all that stuff. And, uh, and it, it was it, it, his whole life, all of our kids, their whole lives, they were the only American Jewish person in wherever they were, always, their whole life. And they were surrounded by Muslims all the time. So that's how they grew up. So they were used to that, and they knew how to navigate that and understand that, and they loved it, and it was fine. So one day, Caleb is, is in his skateboarding days in Jordan. He meets this kid, Hamza, who is a street kid, and he brings him home one day to our apartment, and Hamza just starts hanging out at our apartment. My wife starts just treating him like he's one of our kids. We, have other, we had other young people living with us too that we were training. And so Hamza starts hanging around and he's a really mean kid. He's a really hardcore mean kid because um, his, his father had died when he was young and his mother was in a mental institution and his brother was in jail. And so Hamza just lived by himself. He was, he, he didn't pass in Jordan, you have to take a national test at the end of high school, and if you don't pass, you don't pass any high school. Your, your high school is a waste. It's called the Tojihi test. He failed it three times, which means he will never have a job of any kind of real income ever in his life. Once you get a Tojihi number, that number is who you are the rest of your life. You get a high score, you're a doctor and an engineer, you get a low score. You're working for, he was working, Hamza was working for a dollar an hour at a McDonald's living on the street. He starts hanging out at our house. He's bitter about life. He hates God because God killed his father. And it's, it's funny. You can be an American that hates God, or you can be a Muslim that hates God, or you can be any human that's like, God burned me. He let me down. My mom's crazy. My dad's dead. My brother's in jail. I can't pass the high school test. And so imagine what his identity is to himself. Just imagine. And, and uh, the Middle East is a shame-honor culture. We're a guilt-innocence culture. They're a shame-honor culture. So Hamza is, an, is a shame to his entire family, his cousins. He, he just brings shame on his. 
They don't even like to talk about him because he brings shame on them. So imagine his own identity. If I said, Hamza, hi, what do you think about yourself? He, he was suicidal. But a suicidal Arab kid is who terrorist groups recruit. That's what they want. Because that kid, they'll give that kid's family a lot of money and make his family say, oh, now we're proud of him because now our family's getting all this money. But this kid now is a slave to the terrorist organization, which usually ends means they're going to kill themselves somewhere. So because that's my career of working in these kinds of situations, I recognize Hamza's in grave danger of being recruited, but he'll do it because he's mad. Anyway, so he's, he's hanging out at our house. We, we talk to him a lot. He's, he's not super receptive. He just needs a place to stay. And Caleb, our son, is his absolute best and only friend. He doesn't know, Hamza didn't know that Caleb is Jewish my, because my wife is Jewish, so our kids are legally Jewish. And so all day long, for two years, Hamza just makes fun of and tells awful jokes about Jewish people. And Caleb never tells him that he's Jewish. He's just like, I don't really like that joke. And, but, and over and over, and every time something bad happened to Hamza, it's Jewish people's fault. It's the fault of the Jews in the world and Israel. And Caleb just smiles. Hmm. Hmm. Then at, uh, after two years, 11th grade and 12th grade, one day Caleb says to Hamza, hey, we're, we're best friends, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Caleb says, I really love you. You're like one of my brothers. Hamza can't say those words. He just goes, yeah. He can't, Hamza can't say the word love. He doesn't know what it means. But he loves Caleb because Caleb saved his life. And Caleb said, I just want to tell you something. Just because we're close and I, want, I don't want to have any secrets, I'm Jewish. And Hamza just stares at him and thinks of every day that he's insulted Jewish people, and then he realizes Caleb's mom, my wife, the one who's been taking care of him, is Jew, is the enemy, is Jewish, and his whole worldview explodes, and he says to Caleb, why did you, why aren't you mad at me? Like, I've been insulting your people every day, and Caleb said, Be, because you don't mean it. Just doing it from your own pain. I understand. It's okay. It just broke Hamza's heart. So Hamza starts to have this shift because Caleb loves his enemies. Like he doesn't talk. He never, Caleb never talked about it. He just did it. Did you just get sick of hearing people talk about stuff? And they don't really do anything. They just, they just want to debate it and argue positions. They don't really do anything. And so Hamza's like, he, he can't push back on this because Caleb is Jewish and loves him. So what have, what have I thought about my whole life? Israel hates us and is against us. And he knows that Caleb loves Jesus. He knows that too. And he's like, you're a Jewish person who loves Jesus and you love me? So Jesus is for the Christians and I hate the Christians too. So he, like his whole world is like, wow, this doesn't fit with all the categories I've formed about who's good guys and who's bad guys in the world. Do you know how you have those categories? We're the good guys. You're the, those are usually the categories. I'm the good guy. You're the bad guy. Those are usually the categories. Or whatever team I'm on is the good team and you're the bad team if you're not on my team. So this messes Hamza up. So Caleb's getting ready to graduate from high school in Jordan, and he's already been accepted to business school in Boston because he owns a skateboard company and all this stuff. So he's going to go straight into business school in Boston. And Hamza is working at McDonald's. So I say to Hamza, Hamza, come with me. I'll take you to the U.S. Come with us to the U.S. Let me, let me help you. And he's like, no. He, Hamza will never let me even put my hand on him. He hates any kind of physical touch. He, he hates love. But he loves Caleb. So it's like messing him up. But no, I, I don't want to come to America. I hate America. And I'm like, all right, anytime, let me know. So we leave. We leave so that Caleb can go into uh, university. And we're in the U.S. Here's our little friend. <laughs> he is getting bolder. He loves this story. So just watch. For, there he goes. Oh, there he goes. Okay. So, so we leave, 
And Humza's by himself in Jordan, back out on the street, and he starts thinking, hmm, maybe, maybe what Caleb was talking about, the kingdom of God, in Arabic it's called Melakut Allah, the kingdom of God. Humza starts to think, wow, when Caleb's with me, I feel peace. And Caleb is Jewish, and he believes in Jesus, and he's my enemy, and yet I love him, and he loves me, and I feel peace. Maybe I should be with Caleb, because now that he's gone, I, I don't have that kind of peace anymore. So maybe I should try and go to the U.S. and be with Caleb, and I love skateboarding, and Caleb's the best skateboarder I know, and so maybe I should do that. So Hamza calls Caleb in Boston, and he says, Caleb, this is the Arabic tradition, he calls Caleb because he wants to talk to me. So in, in Arab tradition, to talk to the father, you have to go through the son. Isn't that interesting? So he calls Caleb in Boston and says, Caleb, can you ask your dad that if I come to the U.S., will he take care of me? And will he write a letter to the embassy saying that he'll take care of me? Will your dad do that? And so Caleb... The son comes to the father, and he, Caleb calls me and says, Dad, Hamza wants to come to the U.S. Will you write him a letter to help him get in? And I said to Caleb, Hamza has no education. He has no money. His brother's in prison. No, the U.S. Embassy is not going to let him. They're not going to touch him. He doesn't even, he has nothing. He's a nothing but a risk. And Caleb, my son, says, Dad, you always say that God can do anything. <laughs> this is part of my act right here. So that you can, he's, he went, where'd he go that way? There he goes. Poor guy. Like, does someone want to run open that door for him real quick? Just open those doors and set him free. Thank you. Oh, there he goes. Here he comes. Back up. He's coming to you. There he comes. There he goes. And oh, there we go. <laughs> He'll make it. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. There he goes. Beautiful. Amazing. Okay. I'm going to run out of time here. So there he went. Out the door. Good luck. Thank you. So, Hamza, so, so Caleb challenges me, and he says, Dad, you say God can do the impossible. I'm not asking you if God can do it. I'm asking that when God does it, will you let him come live with you? And I'm like, all right. So Caleb calls Hamza. So, this is how, so Caleb calls Hamza. So once Ka Hamza has gone through the son to the father, and the son has interceded for him, he can now come directly to me. It's very beautiful. It's very biblical. And so Hamza contacts me. And uh, he call, in Arabic, he, he calls me a Caleb's father. That's the Arabic term for me. He calls, he calls me Caleb's dad. And even when he speaks English, he calls me Caleb's dad. <laughs> he goes, hello, Caleb's father? Yes. Um, I'm going to try and get a visa to come to the U.S. Will you write me a letter of sponsorship? And I said, I will. But I said, but Hamza, listen, I don't want, I don't want you to have the wrong expectation. <laughs> the U.S. Embassy is not even going to let you in because you don't have an education, you don't have, you're just, you don't have anything that they're going to require to give you a visa. And he said, yeah, but I've heard many nights when, sitting with you in your apartment how God can do the empire. I'm like, all right. Uh, and so I write a letter to the U.S. Embassy, and I just say who I am, and I say, this kid is going to come, and if you decide to give him a visa, I will take care of him in the U.S. That's all I know how to say. I don't even know if Hamza has a passport. So I just send him the letter, and honestly, I don't think it'll work. So Hamza, this is his first time of prayer. He says to God, he says, God, I think that what you want for me is to be with Caleb in Boston. Um, and so I'm going to go that direction, but I know it's impossible because to get through the U.S. Embassy in my position is impossible. But Caleb says that you can do this like that. And so he goes. He goes to the embassy. He has a passport. He does have a passport, and he has my letter, and that's all he has. And so he goes to the embassy. He goes to the gate where the Jordanian soldiers are. And the soldiers check everyone coming into the embassy. And he goes up to the Jordanian soldier, and, he sa and the soldier's like, what do, you, what do you want? 
And he's like, I want to go into the American section of the embassy, not even to the front section where the Jordanians go, but I want to get into the American section of the embassy. Um, and the soldier says, what, let me see your paperwork. Like, you have to have an appointment. <laughs> and Humza the hands of my letter, uh, which the guy can't read because it's English, and he doesn't speak English. He, he's, he goes, no, where's your appointment? I don't have an appointment. And the soldier's like, well, I'm not, why can I, how would I let you in? You don't even have an appointment. And Hamza says, well, I have this friend, his name is Caleb. And he tells him this whole story. And I insulted him for two years, and I find out he's Jewish, and he's always loved me the whole time. And he talked about God, and Isa, the Messiah, the Jesus, the Messiah. And I feel like my only hope is to be with him in Boston because I have nothing here. And the soldier's like, well, I can't let you in. He goes, but I'm getting ready to smoke a cigarette right now. And I'm going to go stand over there, and I'm going to look that way while I smoke because I like to look at that part of the city. And when I come back, it'd be good if you weren't here. And then he opens the gate. He goes, it'd be good if you were, like, not here anymore. And he goes over and smokes a cigarette, and Hamza walks through the gate into the embassy. Hamza's like, oh, my gosh. Is God real? He goes into the embassy. He gets to the counter where the Jordanian civil servants work. They're the next line of defense against people like Hamza getting into the embassy. He comes in, and there's a Jordanian lady there, and Hamza comes up to her, and he lays down. So the, the woman knows he got past the soldiers. She's like, give me your paperwork. He lays down his passport and my letter. She can speak English. She reads her, my letter, and she goes, well, you need bank statements. You need high school records. You need a return ticket. Like, where is all your paperwork? And he said, this is all I have. And she said, well, what do you want to do? I want to get into the American section to talk to an American counselor agent about getting a visa to the U.S. And she said, you're not going to get in there. Wow, why should I let you in there? I have a friend. His name is Caleb. He's Jew. And she, he tells her the whole story. So what's he doing? He's telling each people, each person he meets about Jesus. He's like evangelizing his way into the embassy. No one told him how to do evangelism. He's sharing his faith on his way into the embassy. And it's working. And so he tells the lady the whole story, and he goes, like, you know, I just feel like the best thing for me is to get with Kay, my best friend Caleb in Boston. And I don't know exactly why, but I feel like that's what God wanted. And she's so moved by him. She wishes he was her son. And she's like, well, I can't really let you in there, but it is time for me to drink tea. So when I go drink tea and you go that way down the hall and turn left, that's the American section, and I didn't let you in, but I, it's tea time, so good luck. And she goes off, and he walks down the hall into the American section where the U.S. Marines are. He goes in, he goes in there with his passport and my letter, and the, the Marine guard is there, and the, because he's in the U.S. section, there's, he's, he's made it. And so the Marine just welcomes him in, and he's super impressed by the Marines, a nice guy. He says, have a seat right there, take a number. He takes a number, he sits down, and then the counselor agents are calling numbers, and so they call his number. And he goes back in, and they bring him back in. It's an American guy, and Holmes sits down, and the guy goes, give me your paperwork. And Holmes hands him his passport and my letter. And the guy goes, give me the rest of all, all of your paperwork. And Holmes is like, that's all I have. He goes, no, I need bank records. I need high school transcripts. I need a return ticket. I need all of this paperwork. And Holmes says, that's all I, this is all I have. And the guy says, he goes, this is a, a U.S. official visa interview. You have none of the paperwork to get into the United States of America. Why would I let you in? Well, it's worked twice, so he does it again. Well, my best friend Caleb is doing blah, 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 and he goes through the whole thing like this. And then the guy goes, well, okay, okay. He goes, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful story. However, you have to tell me what is the purpose of your visit to the United States? What is it? And Hamza says, to skateboard with my best friend Caleb in Boston. And the guy goes, okay, that's not the right answer. Like, how about you're looking for a college? How about something like that? And Tom says, look, I might look for a college, but really, I just want to skateboard with my best friend Caleb in Boston. <laughs> and the guy just sits back, and he goes, oh. 
And he goes, you know what? He goes, I'm from California, and I love skateboarders. And he gives him a five-year visa. He just stamps it. You can go. And Hamza's like, okay, thank you. He leaves the embassy. He calls me. I got the visa. I'm like, you did? How? He goes, well. <laughs> and he tells me this whole story. And I'm like, first of all, I'm afraid for the security of the United States of America. <clears throat> because the guy likes skateboarders, so he let you in. Anyway, so Hamza comes to the U.S. Oh, I wish I had time to tell you this whole story. He comes to the U.S. I pick him up in the airport <laughs> in Atlanta. He comes to live with us. He, he, he gets enrolled. He got, a, he got an actual student visa at this little crummy little English school in Atlanta. And he would walk. I would make him walk every day. He would go to this English school, and he, would, he learned English over a year. And he just would walk every day, and he would just practice English and practice English. And then, and then, he, then after a year, and then he, he and I would be together a lot, and we would talk a lot about it. <clears throat> and and I, he started to like, he started to like become tender. It was really beautiful to watch him. And then um, he would, he, but he's an Arab, so he was funny. Donna would say, I'm going to go to the store. Does anyone want to go with me? And I would say, no, I don't want to go. And Hamza would say, I will go with you. And he looks at me and goes, I will protect her at the store. I'm like, it's Kroger. It's like, not dangerous. But that's his, like, he's honoring Donna. Now that he realizes who Donna really is, like, now he's going to protect her with his life. And he's, now she's like my mother, and I will protect her. And Donna loved having him around all the time. And he, then he moves up to Boston. And he gets in a community college in Boston, an awful community, a terrible community college in Boston. And, and, he, mo- and he lives with Caleb. And they skateboard together. And he goes through two years of this community college. And basically, I, when I would call Caleb, like, Caleb, how's business school going? He goes, do you want to know my grades in the business school or in the community college? Because basically, he was tutoring Hamza all the way through community college. I, Caleb was an amazing person. <laughs> so all the way through community college. And then Thanksgiving, after community college, Hamza's at our house. And he tells our whole family, all of us are there, that he has met Jesus. That he's embraced Jesus. And we're all, everyone's crying and cheering. And then he said, and I've also gotten, I've been accepted to Suffolk University. On his own, he didn't tell anyone he was applying. He got into Suffolk University in Boston with a scholarship. And it's like, oh my gosh, you made it. And we're all rejoicing and cheering. He, get, he, he goes to Suffolk. He's in his, he, in his junior year. He's like one of the top students. From the kid that couldn't pass high school, he's a top student. He's in business school at Suffolk University, and he gets leukemia. He contracts acute leukemia. We're living in Jerusalem. Caleb calls me, Dad. And Holmes' biggest fear in life was that he would get cancer and die like his father and all of his uncles. That was his biggest. He used to say it to me all the time. Every time he felt sick, he would say, I think I have cancer. And so his junior year, he had sent us a letter saying, I feel like I'm in the kingdom of God now. It's amazing. I'm here in the U.S. I, I'm doing well in school. I'm, you know, he, got a, he, he got a green card. It was all this amazing stuff. And then leukemia. <laughs> Goes straight into the hospital. They start pi- spinal chemotherapy on him. And the doctor, we fly back, and we're with the doctor. And he's like, this is it's really bad. And he shows us a slide of the leukemia in his body of a spine. And his spine is just black. And the doctor's like, we're going to just keep him in here. Um, and they told Hamza, you're, no, you, you're, you're going you know, to have to be sterile. You're not going to have kids. We're just going to have to like, attack this with everything we have because it's really bad. And Hamza's just devastated by it. And so we go and sit with him in the hospital. And we're talking to him. And, you know, and then we do these shifts because he has to stay in there for four weeks of intense and it's super painful to him. And so Caleb would come part of the time, and then me and Donna would go and sit with him, and we just rotate like this. And one day, Caleb's in the hospital. About the second weekend, Caleb's sitting with him in the hospital, and Hamza's on these drugs. And he, he starts, he says, Caleb, he says, Caleb, I'm afraid, because they're, he and Caleb are like Jonathan and David. They're like, they're Jewish and Muslim, and they both love Jesus, and they're like, and he says, he says to, and they're the same age, Caleb, I'm afraid. And Caleb moves over next to him and says, tell me about what you, it's like we're doing together. He goes, 
tell me what, where your fear comes from. And Holmes is like, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm lost inside of a warehouse that's falling down. It's falling apart, and I'm stuck inside of it, and I can't get out. And Caleb says, walk around in the warehouse. Look around in the warehouse. God, walk him around in the warehouse. And Caleb can't tell if it's the drugs or it's an actual vision. He can't tell, but Caleb grew up in this stuff, and he knows how to do this with people. And, and Caleb, I think, he was in his junior year in college, and he's walking him through, and then, and then Humza says, oh, yeah, there's like a doorway or a window over here, and Caleb's like, go, go look at the door, and then Humza falls asleep. So we come in in the next shift, and Caleb's like, Dad, I think Humza had a vision, but I don't know, but I, th- I think the Lord is trying to tell him something about his body and I said, okay, so Hamza wakes up later, I'm with him, me and Donna are with him, and he's alert, and I said, do you remember what you said to Caleb about the warehouse? And he goes, yeah, kind of, kind of, he says, but not really, and I said, okay, let's do it again, awake. Let's ask the Lord to walk you through it to see if it's from God or it was the drugs or whatever. Let's just see if you can go back through it again. And so he can't, we do, we walk back through it, Lord, what do you want him to know about the warehouse? How does, it, Humza, how does it make you feel in the warehouse? It makes me afraid. Lord, what's the fear? That I, and then he says that the warehouse is I'm inside my body and my body is shutting down. That's, that's what he, he goes, that's why I'm afraid. I'm dying inside my body. My body is the warehouse. The pipes are caving in. Everything's falling. Okay, okay. Lord, what do you say about this? See, we're not like pretending this is not real. It's real. He is in danger and it's really happening and I don't know what's happening. It's not magic. I can't just make him well. And God doesn't promise to heal people every time. He, it, healing's an option, but we don't know. It's, God, what do you want me to know? And what do you want me to do? That's all Hamza's asking. He's not calling in some major faith healer to do all this stuff. It's like, God, what do you want him to know? And what do you want to do? And Hamza said, I'm in the warehouse, and I'm afraid, and I feel like it's falling in on me. And then he goes, then, however, there's a door or a window over there and I'm going to go towards, it's a light, I can see a light, he walks to the light, you know, and then he gets to the light, and he goes, oh, now I know, I know, I know what it is, and he, and so I said, what, and he said, it's like my blood is poison, and he said, but my, and my father's blood was poison, and my grandfather's blood was poison, and my uncle's blood is poison, he goes, and it's poison, it kills us, And he said, but it seems like Jesus is saying that he wants me to have his blood. To have his blood and that his blood gives life, it doesn't poison. He's asking me to say yes to having his blood. I'm like, you have a choice. You have a choice. What do you want to do? Do you want to inquire of the Lord or do you want to just think to yourself? He's like, well... He goes, I want the blood of Jesus. I want the blood of Christ. And he just says, Jesus, I'll take your blood. We pray that. Pray over him. That's the end of that. Two days later, the doctor comes. We go back to the hospital to be with Hamza. The doctor comes in, and he says, he sits down, and he goes, "Uh, I I need to talk to you guys. Yes. He said, uh, so we did a spinal tap on him. You know, we were looking at his spine this morning, and he said, uh, this is really, something that's really interesting has happened. And I said, yeah, and he shows us the slide. It's completely white. He goes, obviously, I'm the best leukemia doctor in the world because the leukemia is gone. <laughs> And, and so in, so Hamza, he has to go through the whole protocol, though, legally. So he has to go through two years of, you know, losing his hair. He went through the whole thing. But from that day on, there was no more leukemia. Hamza, he lives in San Francisco now. He's quite a famous photographer with Magnum Photography, which is a very elite photography group in the world. And over his bed, wherever he lives, he has the two slides of his spine. The before the blood of Christ and after the blood of Christ. His life, I, I, I could go on and tell you more about him, but, but he carries a little notebook around with him. He was just with us in Seattle for a week. He, he carries a little notebook around with him, and when he's going through life as he does, he's a very introspective and uh, thoughtful guy, introspective in the healthy way, 
And when he, he has a certain feel, he's very in tune with his body. He's a super handsome guy. He, and he's very in tune with his body. And when he gets this certain feeling, he stops everything he's doing. He pulls out his journal because his, it's like he, know, he knows God's getting ready to say something to him. And so he'll stop and he'll go, okay. He can feel it in his body and he'll go, okay, what? And then he'll write down the thoughts that come to his mind after that sensation in his body. And he makes decisions based on those ideas. And I, I could stand here for another hour and tell you what's happened in his life. It's how he got into Magnum Photography, which is an invitation-only photography fraternity. He, he was invited. I, like I, I could, it's unbelievable. But the way he does it is if he was up here talking to you, he'd say, I carry a listening journal around with me, and as I'm going through my everyday life in the world with Jesus... When he calls me, he says, I, I stop everything, open my notebook, and what? And he writes down these ideas, and then he starts to work on how those ideas are played out in real life. That's what he does, and it works. That's called being a follower of Jesus. That's what it is. That's what it's all about. The beauty of that story is that Caleb could give away what he had in the kingdom to Hamza. That's the beauty. Caleb didn't just have it. He could have it and give it away. That's how Caleb lives his life. He's the same way as Hamza does. Caleb has a listening journal. His, he's, his wife is a, quite a well-known journalist. She, that's how they live. They plan out their lives, but when they're alone in the morning communicating with God, they write down ideas that they have about their identity, about their future. And then they go to work it out on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And it's, a way to, it's an incredible way to live. Caleb could give that gift of transformation to Hamza. Caleb and Hamza, when they were in college on Friday nights, would go into the mosque, and Hamza would stand among the Muslim men and talk about how he met Jesus. And then he would say, the person that introduced me to Jesus is Caleb, my Jewish friend. In the mosque, they would do this. And all the Muslims are like, you brought a Jewish guy in here, and you're telling us about Jesus. You and your Jewish friend are talking about Jesus. Yes, and, the, and, they, and Caleb and Hums always say, this is the kingdom of God, Jew, Muslim, united in Christ. That's the kingdom of God. And it would amaze the Muslims. Then they would go to the synagogue together, and Caleb would do it. I'm a Jewish person. I'm a follower of Jesus. This is my best friend, Hamza. He's a Muslim. And he's a follower of Jesus, and this is the kingdom of God. Jew, enemy, Muslim, together, united in Christ. This is the kingdom of God. And that's, what, that's how they live. And you can't argue with this stuff. Do you want to debate politics and all that nonsense, or do you want to live like this? They cut right past all the conflict, all the arguments, all that stuff. So here's your challenge. You have this challenge. You, you have your, this amazing future ahead of you. Here's a decision you have to make. Am I going to live this life inquiring of the Lord and bringing it down into my rational everyday life and living it out, or am I going to spend my life asking myself what to do? I say, I think, that you should practice and get really good at inquiring of the Lord and living it out. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it'll be the smartest thing you've ever done. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Let me pray for you guys. Father, thank you for these amazing identities that are sitting in this room. Thank you for Hamza, Lord. Hamza Zahran. What an amazing thing you've done in his amazing life, Lord. Thank you for him. He's such a humble, powerful kid. Thank you for meeting him, Jesus, in his darkest place. Thank you for always being willing to be with us. No matter whether we ever acknowledge you or not, you're always with us. And thank you for the day that when we do, you're right there and you're saying, let's go. I've been with you the whole time. Let's go. Let's go. Alive and free. Alive and free. That's what Jesus promises us. And so, Lord, would you just walk with these kids as they, as they struggle to understand you and wrestle through the things in their life with beauty and joy and love and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Lord, would you send them out to, to change the world, to really change the world, not in theory, but in reality. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.